Hey Compass students, welcome to today's video. We are actually starting a new series today called Habitudes. Yes, you heard me correctly, we're making up words. I said Habitudes. God is everywhere and he's always at work. But if we want to experience his presence, we must also join him in his work. The work that God calls us to do, the things he wants us to be doing, are called spiritual disciplines. And these require us to devote our time, our talents, our treasures to God and his great mission for this world. When we join his mission with devotion, we experience all the blessings of God's presence and God's provision. When we develop and maintain consistent habits that God asks us to do, we will see that our attitude towards God and towards life will drastically change. Our habits change our attitude, right? Habitudes, that's the idea. Anyways, that's where we're going over the next couple of weeks as we kick off this series called Habitudes. But before we get too far, and I wanna ask you this question. When was the last time that you really, really wanted something really bad, but you couldn't have it? What was it that you wanted? Why couldn't you have it? How did that actually make you feel? For the month of January, my family and I decided to do something called a whole 30. Everyone in my family except for me has a bunch of food allergies and to try and make better eating choices as, as a family um, we decided to do this thing called a Whole30. If you don't know what that is, basically a Whole30 is no sugar, no dairy, no grains, no beans, no gluten, no bread, nothing good that tastes good, nothing at all. You have to eat basically like a pet rabbit and you eat a bunch of meat. The problem with this is my best friends are Ben and Jerry. I love ice cream and because of this Whole30, uh, I couldn't have any ice cream and it made me really sad. So this Whole30 in the month of January, I really lived in this tension of really wanting ice cream but not being able to get it. And I couldn't hang out with my best friends, Ben and Jerry, because I committed to doing this Whole30. And I ended up in the month of January having three meals where I cheated on my Whole30. Not, not too bad, right? But all three of those meals, you bet I had ice cream and it was glorious. But when was the last time you really wanted something uh, but you couldn't have it. Maybe it was a food that you wanted really bad, but you couldn't eat it because maybe you got your wisdom teeth pulled or you, you developed an allergy or something. Maybe it was a video game that you wanted to buy, but you couldn't afford it. Maybe you really want to travel somewhere right now, but because of the continued state of our world, you're unable to go places and travel. Take some time wherever you're at, pause this video right now and answer that question wherever you're at. When was the last time you wanted something really bad, but you couldn't have it? Then come back in a little bit, press play, and we will keep on in this video. Ready? Go. So part of our decision to do the Whole30 in January was to create better habits for our family um, around food and create some self-discipline in our lives to stop eating a lot of foods that really aren't great for us. And as we begin our series Habitudes today, we're gonna be talking about two things that really go hand in hand in the Bible that truly take a lot of self discipline. We're going to be talking about fasting and prayer. When fasting is talked about in the Bible, it's assumed and expected that prayer was a large part of the fasting period. Keep this in mind as we go on. Fasting and prayer are joined together in a really, really strong way um, in the scripture, in the Bible. And it's hard to separate the two of them um, as we look at the Bible. But fasting is so much more than skipping a meal or avoiding sweets and desserts for, for just a season. True fasting involves obedience, justice, self-denial, and drawing close to God in prayer. Through fasting and prayer, we connect with God and open our lives to receive his whole blessing. We're going to be looking at Isaiah 58 today. God is instructing Isaiah to address a problem amongst the people in this chapter during this time. The problem at hand was that people were doing really religious things, but for really, really selfish reasons. People were fasting, they were praying, they were observing the Sabbath, which was a day set aside to receive rest through fasting and through prayer. But they were doing these things in such selfish ways that it caused them to ignore the needs around them, such as people who were going hungry, people in poverty, people who were homeless, and the list goes on. The solution that God offers is true devotion to God, which grows naturally out of love for God. People who truly love God will worship God for the sake of honoring him, rather than doing something like fasting or praying to try and manipulate blessings from God. And if people truly love God, people will also love those whom God loves, the people around us who are in need. And that love for God will actually be proven by taking steps to care for and meet the needs of those people in need around us. 
And so God addresses this selfish religious duty problem in Isaiah chapter 58. God is speaking to Isaiah in this chapter. And so we're going to jump in and read it together. Let's read it. This is Isaiah 58 verses 4 through 10. It says, Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and do not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So the Sabbath day referred to in this chapter was a day in which the people were to receive rest through fasting and through prayer. Again, the problem was that the people were fasting and praying, but for completely selfish and wrong reasons. They were doing seemingly good things, but with completely wrong hearts and attitudes. Fasting was this idea that you would not eat for a period of time. You would abstain from eating food to dedicate yourself to the Lord and show your devotion to Him. Again, fasting and prayer went hand in hand. The idea was that as you abstained from eating food, you were additionally looking to prayer with the Lord to fill you and to sustain you. Fasting and prayer point to something even more necessary for life than food, and that's communion with God and dependence on God. Fasting was sometimes commanded, sometimes it was voluntary, and sometimes done out of religious rituals. But it is consistently portrayed with themes of disruption and restoration. In the midst of disruption and chaos, fasting comes to symbolize determined dedication to the Lord and hope in Him. Through repent repentance and prayer, fasting can signify the centering of oneself in humility and the renewal of the relationship to God as the primary sustaining force in one's life. So, what then is the purpose of fasting? You know, it's interesting to note that the first sin that entered into the world was centered around a lack of self-control in regards to food. Adam and Eve were given the command, the one command, to not eat from a specific tree. And what did they do? They end up eating from it when tempted. From the beginning of creation, we have been called and commanded by God to exercise self-control, self-restraint, self-discipline, self-denial when it comes to food. We do not have unrestricted freedom when it comes to the self-gratification of our appetite. Unrestricted freedom in the world of food is unhealthy and unhelpful for, for all of us, which is why from the beginning, God put into place the expectation that we as people should have self-control and exhibit self-denial with food. So first and foremost, the initial purpose of fasting is to honor the commands of God and prove His work in our lives. In addition to this, there were a number of different purposes for fasting in the Bible. And I want to go through those really quickly, quickly just for some context. There was fasting as a means of mourning or grief. When tragic events struck, fasting was, was often an expected response in Scripture. When a disruption happened in a situation or in someone's life, fasting was often the response to reflect that disruption in normal day-to-day -day life. Eating is obviously a normal habit, so to reflect the state in the individual or circumstance, a disruption in normal activity was often the response as a way to intensify the experience of the sorrow or abnormality of the situation. Basically, 
When bad things happened, people fasted to really allow themselves to feel the weight and gravity of the disruption or the bad thing that was happening. There's fasting as repentance. In addition to fasting over grief or mourning because of disruption, many people fasted in the biblical times as a way to show personal grief over sin and as a show of repentance. As a way of humbling oneself, a person would abstain from food as a sign of repentance from sin. Fasting as a way to humble oneself before God is the next thing. Fasting can actually be used as an act of worship. It leads us to a place where we humble ourselves because it forces us to remind our minds and our bodies that we don't really rely on food to sustain us, but we rely on the Lord as the true giver of life. Not just in a general sense, but specifically on a day-to-day basis. It is God who sustains us and gives us life each day. So we abstain from eating to humble ourselves before God and remind our hearts and our minds that nothing but the Lord is the true sustainer of life. There's fasting as an aid in prayer. Prayer and fasting, again, are frequently connected in the Bible. Most references to fasting in the Bible include prayer in their context. Fasting was a way to intensify prayer. It was a way to physically represent a prayer life, engaging not just the mind and the heart in prayer, but also the body by abstaining from food. Many viewed fasting and prayer together as a way to show serious dedication to the Lord. The mindset would be something like, okay, God, like we really mean business right now. Watch us as we dedicate ourselves to you in prayer with the mind and with the heart, but also with our bodies as we abstain from food and don't eat. As an aid in prayer, fasting helps us to return to the sustaining presence of God. And this is another reason why prayer is so important. It's not enough to just not eat food. The point of fasting is to refocus our mind and body on the true sustaining presence in our life. Not food, not water, not stuff, or anything else, but God himself. Self-denial leads to a refocusing and returning to the sustaining presence of God in our lives. So there's this major heart component when it comes to fasting. Again, it's not enough to just not eat or commit to not being on social media or whatever it might be. And this was the problem in Isaiah chapter 58. The people were doing all of these religious things. They were fasting with their bodies, but their hearts were in the completely wrong place. With this in mind, it's important that we ask ourselves this question. How then are we to fast and pray today? Again, the problem being addressed in the chapter we read from Isaiah is that the people fasted and prayed, which were seemingly really good things, but they did them with such selfish and wrong intentions. So we then are to fast and pray first and foremost with authentic humility before God. Isaiah 58, 3 says this, God says, Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure. When we talk about authenticity and humility before God, here's here's what we mean. Don't fast and pray to manipulate God. Don't fast or pray to get God to bend to your will and to your desires. Fast and pray instead to take yourself and bend yourself to the will and desire of God of God. Secondly, our fasting and prayer should lead to concern for our neighbor. Not only in this chapter of Isaiah are the people being fake, they're also not doing what God really asked them to be doing. Isaiah 58 verses 6 and 7, God again says, Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is, not to, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? In these verses, God very clearly says, when you fast and pray, it should cause you to be concerned for the people around you who are in need. If you're not, it's not the type of fasting and prayer that God wants. The type of fasting God wants from us, the type of prayer that God wants from each of us is fasting and prayer that rids us of our selfishness and causes us to bend ourselves and our will and our desire to the will and desire of God in such a way that we would sacrifice our resources to help those in need. God wants fasting and prayer that causes us to give up our own desires to meet the needs of those around us. So to be very clear, after hearing about fasting and prayer from a biblical context, how should we fast and pray today? First, we should fast and pray with humility and authenticity before God. Meaning we should fast and pray not to manipulate God or bend him to our will and desire, but instead we should seek to fast and pray so that our selfishness and our will and desire would be bent towards God's will and desire for us. And then secondly, we should fast and pray in such a way that we sacrifice our resources to meet the needs of others. 
Our prayers, our fasting should lead us to a place of giving up our desires and resources to meet the needs of those around us. By forgetting yourself and your own pleasures through fasting and through, pro- and through prayer, your pleasure and satisfaction, your true fulfillment in God actually increases. It's this beautiful irony that is found in fasting. As we deny ourselves, as we forget our own pleasures and deny fulfillment from food, our pleasure, our true fulfillment can be found in Christ and Christ alone. Let us choose to pursue Jesus in this way. Let's pursue him through our prayers, through our fasting, in such a way that it causes us to be humble before God, in a way that we're not manipulating God to get what we want, and in a way that we sacrifice to meet the needs of those around us. Compass students, we love you. We're so thankful for all of you. We hope you guys enjoy your time now in small groups talking more about fasting and prayer together. We'll see you next week.